much less work in the north because there was always thought to be that this was a completely separate ecosystem. With a lot of the climate change and warming and breakdown of the cold pools that, that people up here are very, very familiar with because it's very much happening in your backyard, that's starting to change. And our concerns about a lot of those changes and its effect on the entire ecosystem has precipitated a need to try to do more monitoring work within this region. So sort of my talk outline today is, uh, Okay, that's not the button, it's the one over there. <laughs> I can see her on the screen. Um, okay, so today I'm just gonna go over a little bit about kind of our, our survey areas, the gear that we use, the vessels we use, because a lot of you have maybe seen them over the years, and then mainly focus on our results. So temperature results, distribution and abundance, and actually some of the size of the fish that we're seeing, and also invertebrates and um, other benthic organisms that live throughout the area, so crab, um, snails, urchins, and then some special studies. So this is actual special research that's actually helping us to understand more of what's going on with these changes in the ecosystem. So such things as uh, tagging cod to determine movement patterns, also fish condition, something that in the past we haven't really thought about. We always used to think of fish in the Bering Sea as being extremely healthy. With a lot of these changes in the ecosystem, that may no longer be the case, at least not always the case. We're also doing some work where we put down acoustic moorings so essentially devices that sit on the bottom turn on on occasion and they um, look acoustically at what's swimming above them, mostly pollock, and we can actually determine movement patterns of fish throughout the region. And we're mainly doing this to figure out fish movements over the transboundary line between the U.S. and Russia. So even in this picture here, you can see um, in the upper right, this is one of our survey vessels and some of our crew working up a catch, all the little baskets all around as people sorting everything to species. We actually work up everything. We're doing ecosystem level surveys. So it's not just commercial fish. It's everything from the tiniest little amphipods that come up to the great biggest fish. Everything we catch, we quantify, count, and collect data on. It's one of the few surveys actually in the world that's gone for as long as ours has in the southeastern Bering Sea as well as the northern Bering Sea or is as comprehensive. This is a big effort, takes a lot of staff and a number of days. Um, and you can kind of see it. We're talking about, you know, some of the smaller fish we're getting are things like these little rock sole that are down here in the two or three centimeter range, not something this big, to larger cod, like the one over there that we're um, preparing to do some uh, collect otoliths or age structures. So it's ear bones that allow us to um, age the fish. But, and again, so our main purpose for doing this is to have a better understanding and monitoring of the marine ecosystem of Alaska. So most people, when you think of the ecosystem, it's everything from the phytoplankton to the zooplankton, forage fishes, which we collect data on, benthic fishes and midwater fishes, take this picture of this pod, crabs, toothed whales, pinnipeds, seabirds. But the main reason for putting this slide up is that I always want to try to remind people that particularly in these, this region, that people are part of this ecosystem too. And actually one of the greatest tools to us and one of the reasons why it's really important to us to come out and reach out and communicate with, say, Savunga, Gamble, the people of Nome, is that you people live here year-round. You see what's going on here on a daily basis. You have an understanding of what's kind of normal and what is not in this ecosystem. You are the sentinels for this region. People like Duane and I, we're here for six weeks out of a summer. Summer represent what you guys see year-round? Do you think the six weeks we're here, even of the summer, is represented what you see year-round? So keep that in context in the results that we show. This is a snapshot of what's happening in the summer. And we really depend upon the sentinels, the people of this region to also communicate with us and try to help fill us in on where we might be wrong or the things that are happening at other times of the year um, because we really don't see it all. So just to reiterate, um, these are kind of the two survey areas. I'm trying to be good and stay here. I tend to like to walk around and I know that uh, Gay is trying to record the sound. She seems to be collecting people in the office now, I see, trying to work and getting it to go. <laughs> it's quite comical. Um, so in the southeastern Bering Sea, so this area that's surrounding in green, we've done that survey the same exact way since 1982. So that means we go to the same spots, we use the same exact gear, we do it in the same way. 
And this gives us a very strong data set for being able to look for ecological change. Um, for the Northern Bering Sea, we've only surveyed this area comprehensively using those same techniques for three years, 2010, 2017, and 2019. And again, that work is very much predicated on concerns about the loss of seasonal sea ice and how that is changing, not just the Northern Bering Sea, but the entire Bering Sea ecosystem. So these changes, everyone is in the same boat. Things that are happening up here have an impact on the areas to the south of you. Even though we have not had um, enough resources to move our survey even into the Chukchi or further north, it's also having effects on that region as well. So if there's a lot of change going on, we need to get a more comprehensive idea of how and to try to provide data to everyone, to the communities, to um, uh, federal agencies, everyone to have a better understanding of what's happening. And in the case for us, this really focuses on these topics, the ideas of movement of fishes, movement of crabs, other sea floor invertebrates, also monitoring the populations of ones that we would use words like sessile, which means they don't move anywhere at all. So they're just at the whims of whatever the change is right near them and they can't get up and go somewhere else. Those can be ones that can actually tell us a lot about what's happening in a marine ecosystem. If you can't get up and go somewhere, you're at the whims of what's going on in the environment around you. We also do things like determine population size, age structure, genetics, from for important species. So also a lot of this information, as you're, I'm sure you're aware, in the southeastern Bering Sea area, goes into stock assessment models that are used to manage things like the, um, the very large pollock fishery, um, red king crab fishery, um, snow crab, all that. So we get a lot of data into that. We also are trying to look for change in food web. We collect a lot of the stomachs of the fishes and different animals. We also collect organisms that could be a potential food resource so that we can idea how those linkages occur and where they may be changing. So that tells us a lot about what's happening in the greater scope. And we collect a lot of environmental data, water temperature, salinity, light, light at depth. All these things have a big impact and are changing. You know, if you think about it up here, um, I do a lot of research with uh, vision, fish vision, and actually light. You have an area up here that used to be particularly in the winter covered with sea ice. It makes it very dim. You now have organisms that are now living in an area that's much brighter for a good chunk of the year, or also a lot greener in terms of plankton blooms. And we don't have a good idea of how that impacts benthic organisms or even some of the fishes that were adapted for something very different. We're trying to get a better handle on these things. And again, a lot of this, at least for this region, is associated is based on looking for changes associated with the loss of seasonal sea ice. This is our what we call an 83112 research trawl. So this is the net we use. So when we use the word trawl, people have a tendency to think about um, you know, the big commercial boats and these big massive nets that they use to catch pollock down south. All right. We use actually, as you'll see in the, in the slide in a moment, we use commercial fishing vessels. We charter them to help us do our work. NOAA doesn't have enough ships. This is an easy way of getting guys that are very uh, efficient with this type of gear and can help us do a lot of the research. But they look at our net and they laugh. This is a little tinker toy, right? So when we say trawl, with the research trawl, it's not the same thing. Um, in fact, our net, the opening, so it rides, just skims across the top of the seafloor. And the opening is only about two to two and a half meters. So that means this high, okay? Eight feet, maybe nine feet tops is our opening. So we're only catching really the animals that are within this and the bottom. The width is about 50 feet. We tow that for 30 minutes, bring it up, and process everything we see. And again, our foot row, which is the part that touches the bottom, is just a piece of chain with a piece of uh, hydraulic hose wrapped around it. So it just barely touches and skims along. So we're able to get the crabs, we get snails, but we don't get things that are below because it doesn't dig in. So we really don't sample things like clams well or anything that would be below the surface. We also, I guess for that matter, are not sampling well things that are higher up in the water column. So truly pelagic fishes, we don't get well. Things like salmon. Our net's too small and it's also not high enough in the water column. We basically don't get salmon except for the rare stupid one. Okay. So these are the vessels that we've used for the last few years. A lot of you have probably seen these in town, tied up. We've used the Alaska Knight now uh, since 2010. And the best around for the Bering Sea work and Northern Bering Sea work, this is the sixth year 
for the Vester Allen, but historically for our um, center, the Vester Allen has been used in the survey since, actually since the 90s and um, has a long-term uh, research history. Alaska Knight's a little bit newer to the picture, but both of these have been extremely good platforms for us. Again, they're <laughs> commercial vessels that participate in different fisheries, but when they're here, they're doing research. So when you see these boats, they're not up here fishing, they're here collecting scientific data. So right into some of the results. Uh, start off with looking at some of the um, physical data, which we would consider to be water temperature. And in this case, what we're talking about is water temperature essentially near the bottom, C4 bottom temperature. We put a sensor on our net that's on that head rope, that part that's like eight, nine feet high, and it's collecting continuously what the water temperature is. So it's not exactly on the bottom, but it's very close. And what we're able to do is build these maps. And the thing I want to point out to you is when you look at 2010, that was the year we were able to do the northern Bering Sea as well as the southeastern Bering Sea. And it's our one instance in this time series where we did the entire survey range, and it's what we would consider to be kind of an average cold year. So you talk to communities up here, they all know it was warming even before 2010, but this is the closest reference point we have in our data set where we went into the northern Bering Sea and it was actually somewhat cold. And the way you can tell that is, is you see all this kind of blue and purple? That area is water near the bottom that's actually very, very cold. It's below two degrees C, okay? It's referred to by oceanographers as the cold pool. And what it's formed by is the, the seasonal ice from the previous winter. As ice comes down, freezing from Bering Strait and from the Gulf of Anadir down through this area, Sea ice or um, seawater doesn't really want to freeze, right? Because of the salt content. But as it gets very, very, very cold, what starts to happen is you form a very um, dense brine. So essentially, the salt starts to precipitate out, and you end up with this hyper cold, very dense water that sinks to the bottom. And the fresher water freezes at the surface. In a really simple sense, that's what happens when seawater freezes, okay? What that does is that dense water, when it sinks to the bottom, forms what we call the cold pool. It will persist, not just through the winter, but into the summer. So we're surveying June, July, August, and this is water that's on the bottom from the previous winter ice coverage. So the extent from one year to the next of the cold pool is directly proportional to the, essentially the quality or thickness of the ice and the duration in which you had ice covered. So here's when there's good ice cover and it stays for a long time, the cold pool starts to extend way down, almost touching the Alaska Peninsula. We have years where it would fill almost this entire area. This is important because when we start talking about subarctic fishes, things like Pacific cod or walleye pollock, they don't like to enter this any more than they have to. Uh, the water's cold enough for them that metabolically they can't do things like digest food. So they tend to stay out of it. They'll stay in the periphery. Well, if they're staying in the periphery, effectively this becomes a barrier to fish migration for those species to areas like the northern Bering Sea. Okay, we get to 2017, that cold pool starts to break down. The water is much warmer because there was limited sea ice in the previous winter. And this area right here in between where you see it breaking down, that is actually not cold enough to serve as a physiological barrier to pollock and cod. They can move through this, and they're willing to move through this. The other thing to notice is that areas like Norton Sound are always warm. Even in years like 2010, where it was a cold year, all this red, warm water. That's because in part, Norton Sound is very shallow, and also it has a lot of freshwater input. So you have rivers and streams that are essentially that water is warming up as it moves across land, pouring in there, and that this area warms up. So there's just not a lot of um, depth of water for it to mix with. So that's always been the case. This area has always been warm. So then you get to 2019, and you can see that last year, last winter, we had very poor ice, but you had slightly more than 2018, right? But not much. So this is actually slightly bigger cold pool than we saw last year, but still not enough to actually be a barrier to fish movement. The other thing that we see is 
this inner shelf, kind of the near the Alaskan coast, is extremely warm. In fact, this here, it's probably hard to read at eight degrees C. Much of this is actually over eight degrees C. In fact, some of the um, algorithms we use to process our data started to have problems in Martin Sound because the water in Norton Sound response is not only above eight degrees C, it's over 10 degrees C. In fact, it's as high as 14 degrees C on the bottom in some parts of Norton Sound this last year. So that's what, 60 to 62 degrees Fahrenheit. That's very warm. We never thought, actually, for since 2017, we did the rapid response survey in 2018. In 2018 and now in 2019, we have had to rewrite those algorithms for the last two years to uh, be willing to accept warmer water temperatures that we thought we would never reach. Here's the same series of data, but for the water temperature at the surface. So what you can see is in 2010, it was pretty cold on the surface in um, Bristol Bay and kind of the southeastern Bering Sea. Uh, Martin Sound, again, is very warm. 2017 is warmer. We start to see the warm spread out to the west around St. Matthew. And then in 2019, pretty much the entire area is very warm. Now, one feature to point out, just so you guys are aware, you see this kind of like strong dividing line? What that is, is a basically a data artifact. And what that's caused by is if we start our survey at the beginning of June in the eastern part of Bristol Bay. We do our stations going north, south, working our way west through the southeastern Bering Sea survey region, essentially end here. We then run to Nome, change out crew two months later. And then we have one vessel go into Norton Sound sampling, and then it starts sampling this area coming down this way. The other boat comes out, samples over here, and comes down this way. So effectively, this station is sampled in mid-June. These are being sampled end of August. So it's the one spot in our data series where you end up with that kind of effect, where there's a large temporal displacement between when we were here and when we were here. Now, the one good part is, is realize when you look at these stations, they're done within a few days of each other each year. So the maps are still relational to each other, but that's why you get that. Um, and in terms of the warming that we saw on the surface this year, again, using a Norton Sound as an example, um, the same effect as what we saw with the bottom temperatures happened here. So it says greater than 12. Well, we're up to 20 degrees C in a couple of our stations in Norton Sound this last summer. Again, temperatures we never thought we would see. So this data is um, kind of a reference. This is referring to just the southeastern Bering Sea survey area, so not the northern Bering Sea, but it's a good reference point. One of the things, because the um, cold pool can actually serve as a de facto barrier to fish movement, we actually calculate what we consider to be an index, which we call the cold pool area. How much of the proportion of the total area of the southeastern Bering Sea is under the cold pool? And what you can see is, is that there's been years, like 1999, when in essence 80% of the southeastern Bering Sea had water temperatures at the bottom below 2 degrees C. Here's our last two years. Last year it was 1%. This year it's about uh, 6%. But the other thing you'll see here is that there's only green and a little bit of yellow. There's none of the stuff that's actually cold enough to be a true barrier to fish passage. Okay, so we're below the oceanographer's definition of a cold pool, but not down into the stuff that will actually impede fish in the southeastern Bering Sea for the last two years. Mean temperatures, so on the bottom, here's the long term survey average of 2.5 degrees C. Here's our last two years. This year was a record high for the mean temperature for the entire region, 4.35. That's the highest we've ever seen. 
In terms of the surface, it's the second highest that we've had on record. Actually, 2016 was warmer by one tenth of a degree at 4.53. This year was 4.42. Or excuse me, 9.42 and 9.53. All right, so how does this affect some of the species distributions and overall numbers? So let's start with looking at some of the crab species. In this case, we have snow crab. So snow crab, there is a commercial fishery for snow crab. And um, it's one of the species that we know, I mean, even it's in their name, snow, they actually prefer to be in the colder water. And so one of the things that we're seeing over time with their distribution is as the availability of cold water has shrunk, their distribution is starting to retract towards the areas where there actually still is some cold water. It's not as cold as it used to be, but it's still about the coldest we got. And that ends up being in that area that historically held the cold, down through what we call the middle domain of the Bering Sea. And you can see that in 2017 and 2019. So for the Northern Bering Sea, that has meant that we've actually seen a decrease each of the last two years during the warming in the overall biomass estimate of this area. So biomass estimates, what this is, is that we take the samples we get from the survey and those weights, and we essentially expand it to what we would estimate would be the total weight for the entire area. So the biomass estimate from the Northern Bering Sea is our estimate of what the total weight of all snow crab would be in that box. And so what we see is these precipitous drops. But those drops are not necessarily mortalities. This isn't that the fish or the crab are um, dying. What else would it be? Like we just talked about, there's this movement. There's the survey line right there. We're starting to see some movement this way. And in fact, in this last year, there was a slight increase for the southeastern Bering Sea, which is a larger area. So some of this is just the movement of the animals, not like a mortality event. One other thing just to point out so people know, this is the length of the carapace or width of carapace in the case of um, snow crab. And this is data that's only for the northern Bering Sea. And one of the things I wanted to point out is, is that the crab, you're actually what you would consider to be a commercial or legal size, or kind of circled here in red. It's a very small proportion of what we see in the Northern Bering Sea. All the rest of this would be much smaller than um, is considered legal in the fishery. So there's not a lot of kind of legal or harvestable size crab in the Northern Bering Sea. Well, I was working on it. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, so only these ones at this end are of the legal size. And then we have three years here. So the back row is 2010 and what we saw, going from small crab to big crab, 2017 in the middle, and then 2019 is kind of here in the forefront. And you'll see more figures like this, and they're all kind of oriented the same way. So I know the print is kind of small to read. But in essence, for these crab, there's not a lot, and it really hasn't changed. There isn't much difference in the proportion of them that would be, say, legal size in any of the years. But we do see a lot of change in what's happening in the smaller size courses, right? So in 2017, and it's hard to see, but it's roughly a similar peak back here in 2010, there was a lot of very small immature crab that were in the uh, northern Bering Sea region. Now we're seeing the distribution more towards these kind of middle size crab, but they're also still at an immature size. There may be a couple of reasons for this. One may be um, there's less recruitment going on. So we have some studies going on through our Kodiak lab to look into that. The other thing is, is that as we know, uh, what's moved into the area, and we'll go over later, things like Pacific cod, this is their favorite food. And what sizes do they like to eat the most? So that's also a possibility that's playing a big role. Red king crab. So red king crab with uh, warming conditions has seen um, pretty big drops in the southeastern Bering Sea. So in the southeastern Bering Sea, mainly Bristol Bay area, but there are some populations over more towards Rivalop Island. We're also starting to see some movement here to the north each year. 
that 89,000 metric tons in 2010 dropped 60,000 down to 33,000. So the Northern Bering Sea has stayed relatively the same between 2010 and 2017, around 2,500 metric tons, 22. So everyone here, I'm sure, is aware that um, Norton Sound, your king crab fishery, wasn't so great this last year, right? I've heard words used like epic failure. Um, so you probably, the first question you're going to have is, how is it that it was the worst, yet I'm saying there's an increase? Now, there is a little bit of an explanation. One is right here in this figure, and we'll show it again in the next one, but we're looking at that leak frequency data for the last few years. And again, here's the sizes of king crab in the region that are of a legal size. So the vast majority of what we're seeing in the survey in this region, particularly this last year, is of sublegal size crab. Okay. In fact, so much so that here's the data for just Norton Sound. So immature males that are below the legal size increased by 361 percent. Immature females, so small female crab, went up a thousand percent. But Mature legal sized males dropped 51%. The other thing that we found in our survey that's a little harder to see in the data, um, just on a map, but essentially most of the um, larger red king crab that we got were actually deeper this year than what we've seen in the past. So they're more to the west and more, they're, essentially, they're moving their distribution further to the west and out of Norton Sound. Yeah. Uh, what's the, I see on those charts that you just had a slight bar graph, is there, on, on all of these, it seems like you see a whole bunch of in, immature on the snow crab and the red king crab, but then it doesn't seem to transfer towards harvest of those. What, what's going on there? Why do you see all these big numbers just before something that could actually be caught and then it just doesn't seem to ever take the next step in either of these charts? So, there's a number of factors at play there. One is just the way um, populations develop. So this is a little bit abnormal. We would want to see a lot of small crab as well. But essentially, there's always mortality. These things are being predated upon. So, you know, in a classic form, what you would see is a lot of young crab, medium number of medium-sized crab, or right, exactly. You'd want to see these kind of year class regressions, so there'd be less. Right. So if you think about it that way, and you're watching this kind of truncate down. Now let's go and we're going to add a couple of rules. One is, is that we're going to say that we only want to harvest crab that are of a mature size, so they've had a chance to at least reproduce. So that's essentially where a lot of the lines get drawn. So things have had at least a year or more, depending upon the species, to reproduce before they're harvested. And then we're going to allow, based on a set of series of metrics, it's different for every species, some harvest rate. So this thing has moved down, and now we're going to take removals out of the population. This is, in fact, the effect that you get from fish inversion, is that because we are able to push it, you'll knock it down a little bit there, okay? And in particular in crab, because since they allow some portion of the population, I can probably use here to remain to be available to recruit or to mate for the next generation, we can harvest these at a relatively high level. Okay, so that happens a lot in the crab. Um, also realize that just because there's only this many bars in the length, we're starting to talk about this in thousands of metric tons, right? So the number of individuals here is actually quite a lot. It's not just five little bars. There's actually a large number of individuals there. Does that help? I think so. Okay. Is there another? In the middle. So in terms of like as this moves down, so I think that's what we're hoping is that you're having this large number of immature crab. Hopefully this results in good recruitment in the future, but there's a lot of factors that could go into that that we just don't know right now. Um, you, and you'll see this actually in some of the fish day the show as well. The same kind of idea. When you see good recruitment of immature animals, Everyone wants to think, think great. This means that we're going to get more that we can harvest or that, you know, the, that the ecosystem will um, do better in these upcoming years. 
But there's a number of factors that we don't fully understand yet, particularly when you have an ecosystem like yours where it's undergoing a lot of change. So there could be a number of reasons why this may not recruit into a harvestable portion of the population, and there's a lot of reasons why it will. And right now, I, I mean, I'm honestly not a crab biologist. I couldn't put a UN on or know what all is going to happen, but we don't know if, like, say, just hypothetically, crab are doing well at this size, but there is some sort of biological function that they need to do at this size that they're unable to do in the warmer conditions. This could be anything from the food resource that's available for crab at this size is doing well, but the food resource for crab at this size is not. You never know. There's a lot of studies that go into these kinds of things to figure it out. There's a lot of change going up here right now, but it's better not having those. So hopefully this does mean that down, you know, in a couple of years, you're going to have better crab than you do now. <laughs> this here? Yeah. Well, there can be reasons for that as well. Um, if we really want to get into kind of the weeds on this, there's also things that happen when there's change in the environment that affect our survey data. One is, is like we, we throw it all under this umbrella that we call catchability. Okay, and this will come up a lot in different things we talk about. Um, catchability can change. We like to think of this data as we do things the exact same way for a reason. We go to the exact same spots, we do the survey the exact same way. And the reason why we do that and we don't alter the way we do it is then our numbers are relational from one year to the next to the next. That's incredibly powerful, but there's a big assumption that happens with that. And that is, is that we assume that the animals are going to do the same thing from one year to the next. They don't, right? We all know this. And so if crab of this size, because of changes in the environment, they're now doing something different that makes them less available to our survey, that isn't real. Okay, so if say these small crab, instead of being available, like they were here, they were in those locations that we sample, and instead have gone and sought refuge, say in shallower water than we sample, we would have this effect, but it doesn't mean that there's no small crab, right? Or it could be something else. It could be that they move more towards, say, a rock pile. Our gear is very light and fragile. We don't tow there, so we wouldn't get them. So there's reasons that you could also have this effect based on catchability without it being the case. Does that help? Blue king crab. Uh, we're seeing essentially the same patterns as what we're seeing with the reds in that between a large increase that we saw in 2017 and part of this increase is a little bit artificial and that's because as the survey is advanced, because this is the first year we did it, this was the second, we were able to get the boat into areas in 2017 that we weren't able to sample as well in 2010. So we were able to find longer toes. We were able to find some, because this area actually above Cape Lawrence Island all in here is actually a little bit rougher bottom, which is good habitat for blue king crab. It's not as good for our gears. We have to find the spots where we can sample. So as our surveys developed, we got better at it and uh, we caught more, okay? However, sampling those exact same spots, we got a large decrease in the overall biomass estimate between 2017 and 2019. But the same trend is what we saw with the red king crab existed here too, where even though the overall biomass dropped, the actual number of crabs is slightly higher. There's a lot of small crab that we got this year opposed to the larger kind of more mature Crab. Is there a hand or did it? And again, you see, you know, here's kind of that, that effect in that there's not a lot out here in what they consider to be the jumping the sizes that we saw in the survey. Walleye pollock. So, walleye pollock, <clears throat> subarctic species, doesn't like to enter that cold water. And if you remember, that ran right down through here in 2010. The fish are held to what we call the outer domain, essentially deeper water, constrained by the cold pool. They don't really want to enter that any more than they have to. They can withstand it. It's not something that kills them, but they become lethargic and um, they don't uh, um, metabolize food as well. Animals know this kind of a thing, so they try to stay out of it. 
in 2017. Remember that was that little break we talked about. And so there we see this kind of opening. There's also more movement across into the middle shelf, more spread out of the um, pollock biomass. And all of a sudden we see a lot of pollock start to show up in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, in fact, so much so that we went from only 21,000 metric tons of very tiny pollock. Basically, in 2010, when we surveyed in um, this region, it's hard to tell on this figure, but there is pollock up here. It's just a really, really light gray that over there, um, which on this screen resolution is not showing up well. So that worked out to 21,000 metric tons. In 2017, we jumped to 1.3 million metric tons, 600% increase. So, and also not just all these little fish, right? This became adult pollock throughout the region. And then in 2019, essentially that trend continued. It dropped slightly with 1.1 million metric tons, 12% drop. Realize with these estimates, um, there's actually uncertainty built into them, okay? So we, we call it variance. And what that means is, is roughly it's around 10% this year. We know that this number should be fairly accurate, plus or minus about 10%. So if I make that plus or minus 10%, it really means nothing's really changed. It's about the same as it was in 2017. The only real difference is, is that there was a lot more pollock. We're seeing increases in the pollock to the south as well. So people that are worried about are the pollock fisheries going to move north. But no, there's still plenty of fish in the southeastern Bering Sea for the pollock fishery to catch. There is some changes, though, that we are seeing in the pollock that are to the north. And this is where we come back to these length frequencies. So in 2010, just like I just talked about, we see all these kind of little tiny ones. Uh, these are age one pollock, so one year old. And then there's a handful of really good big pollock. That seems to be a classic thing that we tend to see in cold water at the fringes of um, their distribution. So you see this kind of uh, thing in our data for years. Um, even in the northern end of the Northern Bering Sea surveys, they tend to be what we see at about the Mississippi. Come now to 2019, which is just an amplification of what we saw in 2017. We're seeing adult fish of, um, uh, you know, this is a reproductive size, you know, 42 to 55 centimeters, good pollock, and then a lot of age ones. Lots and lots of age ones. We're, we've tried modeling it. We've not been able to come up with a model yet that shows us that age one pollock has an easy way of getting from the southeastern Bering Sea to the northern Bering Sea. So this at least suggests that within U.S. waters of pollock, they're probably not coming from the southeastern Bering Sea. So they're either coming from the Russian side or they're fish that were from spawning events that happened in somewhere near the northern Bering Sea. To also back that up, this isn't our results, but I think they've come here and talked to you. We have uh, colleagues that have done some work. So people like Ed Farley and Janet Becky Anderson have gone not only sampling in the northern Bering Sea, but also in the Chukchi this year. And they found age zero, so less than a year old, walleye pollock larvae in the water column. There's really no way for those to get there except for recruitment events, i.e. spawning in the region. Okay, so we still have a lot of questions about how much movement there is between pollock that have shown up in the northern Bering Sea and to the southeast or even into Russian waters. But we know that they're not just all coming here for summer vacation and then going back down when the ice retreats. We're starting to see these young classes show up where we know that at least some fish is staying up here and spawning, at least either in the northern Bering Sea or on the Russian side. Pacific cod. It's a little bit muddier in the southeastern Bering Sea, but it's essentially the same kind of pattern. They tend to want to stay out of the cold pool area, but their favorite food is what? Those snow crab, right? Those want to be in the cold pool, so they tend to be a little bit more on the fringe of the cold area. They'll kind of foray into it a little bit more than pollock will. When the cold pool broke down, we saw them spread out and large numbers of poly, or, uh, Pacific cod starting to show up in the northern Bering Sea. In fact, we went again, kind of a similar trend from 29,000 metric tons to 287,000 metric tons to 
now in 2019, 364,000 metric tons. And really the pattern we see in um, 2019 is very similar, it's just increased. So one thing to note, I should have mentioned this because it's the same with the pollen. Remember all that really warm water we're starting to see on the inner shelf? You'll see this is a pattern with a number of these species. We started out talking to the folks here about the effects of the loss of the cold pool or the presence of the cold pool on fishes. And the last couple of years, we're now starting to see yet another effect with temperature based. And that is, is that not only are we seeing a retraction of the cold pool, so we're starting to see water in the inner shelf get so warm that that is actually moving fish distribution as well. It's getting too warm. And we're starting to see fish move to the west away from that warmer water that's on the inner shelf. Both Pollock and Cod show this and some others as well. And here's a similar pattern in that distribution. In 2010, all the size of the cod were present in the, in the uh, northern Bering Sea, but in really low levels, just a few degrees from the in uh, 2017, we saw larger size classes show up. 2019, we're seeing the larger size classes show up and age ones in large numbers. And also, our colleagues that have done work further north saw larval age zero Pacific cod as well. So the same kind of pattern. There's some recruitment happening in the area. We still have a lot of questions about fish movement though. How much are they staying? When the ice comes down, do they temporarily follow the ice down? and then move back in. Are they going west into Russia, east? We don't know. Yeah. The Russians doing similar studies? Are the Russians doing similar studies? Is that what you asked? Um, I would assume so. Unfortunately, uh, we don't get a lot of um, information from the Russian side, from the Russian scientist side. We're starting to make some better forays into getting information from them and through some collaborations with some Russian scientists, but not enough to really say a whole lot yes, yet. Um, where we're seeing more information is kind of, uh, you know, the wonderful world of internet scuttlebutt in the sense that the, um, there's a lot of kind of trade websites that the Russians use, the same as we do, kind of promoting their fisheries. And so there's a lot of talk on the Russian side of, because of larger numbers, not only in um, Anadir, but even further north into the, uh, the western side of the Chukchi Sea uh, for fishing pollock and cod. So they're at least making kind of advertising statements of gearing up for bigger fishery because there's more fish. But we don't have any data that we're receiving from them to know how true that is or how much of that there really is. Okay, saffron cod. Uh, I think it also for a lot of people in this region, they also get referred to as tom cod. This is an interesting species. I've always thought these guys are kind of fascinating in that they get classified by a lot of people as being an Arctic species because they're very cold tolerant. Uh, they also are very tolerant of low saline waters, so they tend to be in brackish areas, very near shore. I think a lot of people up here in some of the villages fish them in lagoons. They can be pretty large populations of them in some of the lagoons. Um, but they're not really limited to being an Arctic species. There's even large populations of saffron cod along Kodiak Island. And when presented with warmer conditions, metabolically, they'll gear up and they'll grow pretty fast and do very well. So they're kind of unique in that sense. They can do well in cold water, but they can do even better when it warms up. And it's one of the things that we kind of see. So then 2010, we had a biomass estimate around 90,000 metric tons. It dropped a little bit in 2017 to 76, came back up a little bit in 2019 to 81. Not the same kind of level of dramatic change we're seeing with, say, pollock and cod and uh, some of the other species. The one thing I will say is that the sizes of the fish, oops, I didn't put that one in. In 2017 and 19, on average, they're bigger. So they're growing faster with the warmer conditions. So even though the biomass numbers are a little bit lower, they're doing fine. They're actually a little bit bigger in those years. Yeah. <coughs> I'm sorry, I missed. Uh, 
<clears throat> there certainly are a prey species. I mean, they will get preyed upon by a number of things. I don't think they're getting preyed upon much by Pollock, except for when they're really young and essentially in the larval form, because they're not really offshore very far. Pollock want to be in deeper water than what most of the saffron cod is. They might get consumed a little bit by cod, but we're not seeing that in the diets. So cod are, they get euphemisms applied to them like being pigs of the sea. They'll eat anything. I mean, we found over the years looking at the stomach contents for for doing all that food web analysis we were talking about before, we'll find everything from clams and fish and uh, crab, obviously, to crazy things like tin cans and kids' plastic car toys in their stomachs. They'll eat anything, okay? But in your region, there's an awful lot of their favorite food, which is a small snow crab. So that's not exclusively what we find in their stomachs, but that's a good portion of it. And so I think those crab are also pretty easy to catch. So they're not probably spending a whole lot of time trying to chase down uh, saffron cod. They're eating the crab. So it's possible, but I don't think it's making up much of their diet. Arctic cod, we also get referred to up here as blue cod. This is definitely a more classic um, Arctic species that want to be in that two degree sea or colder water like you would find in the cold pool. And so as such, when we have years like 2010, when temperatures are lower, we get biomass estimates around 37,000 metric tons. When it started to warm up and the gold pool broke down, it dropped 90% to 3,900 metric tons. And really the only area where we got any decent numbers of Arctic cod were right in that area where there was still some cold water. This year, it dropped all the way to 47 metric tons, basically a 99% drop. And the number of individuals we caught, you can count on your fingers. In fact, you can kind of see them here. Each of these blocks, that's a fish, that's a fish. That's a fish. Probably 13 or 14 of them total. That's it. Conversely, in the southeastern Bering Sea, 22,000 metric tons. Here they are down here in 2010. Dropped to a similar number of 3,300 in 2017. It's mostly because of this little tiny bit of here that's across line and we caught exactly one arctic cod this last year in the southeastern areas. So I worked out the two metric tons. Northern rock sole. So this is an interesting species as well. Um, they're more of what you'd consider to be a temperate species. So they want to, they actually have a really wide uh, uh, distribution. They actually extend all the way down into Washington and Oregon. And we always considered essentially uh, the southeast of the Bering Sea, essentially south of Nunavak, as really being the end of their range. They didn't extend any further north. They grew a little slower up here, you know, because of the cold water. And this was really kind of the end for them. Um, with the warming, something really interesting happened in that um, we started to see some um, northern rocks will show up just south of St. Lawrence Island in the Little Miami. And so the Alaska Coastal Current comes up this way, that warmer water, guess what, see where they all are? Right in that warmer water. Comes around this quarter and goes up this way. Right here is a known area for spawning by uh, Northern Rock Soul. And so it looks like Larvae got carried north and settled out into the Northern Bering Sea, essentially just um, south of St. Lawrence Island. And so these fish, in this year, even though there's this large jump in biomass, it's just a whole bunch of fish that are all about two centimeters, two and a half centimeters long, like an inch, right? And then it's not plotted here, but essentially in 2018, that biomass number doubled, and then we see it double again. We're just seeing one year more growth on that same recruitment into this region. So these fish are all now essentially this big, and they grow pretty slow, and but they're doing just fine. So this is essentially a temperate water fish that extends all the way down to Washington, Oregon, that's now making forays into the Northern Bering Sea. At least the southern portion of it. And so there you can see that. Basically, it didn't really catch much of anything. This little low level of, of fish length that we had in 2010 all came from way down here 
kind of along the edge. These fish here showed up in those areas from the 2017 plot. This again is fish that are larger, they're kind of moving up across the line. And then we're seeing these fish steadily get slightly bigger for each of them. Um, particularly at these sizes, they're feeding on um, little polychaete worms and um, amphipods that live on the surface of the mud. So just little tiny stuff that they pick off the surface. Pacific halibut. Pacific halibut are another one that seems to like the warmer water and they're doing okay. And you can see that same kind of pattern through the warmer kind of Alaska coastal current comes up right through here. And sure enough, that's right where we see the most halibut. Now the thing to remember with halibut, remember I said our net's pretty small, right? And so we are very efficient at catching small halibut, not what you would consider to be big halibut or things that people are targeting when they say go long lining or even recreationally fishing or subsistence fishing, okay? So look at something like halibut are managed by the um, International Pacific Halibut Commission. They do a long line survey to assess the population of halibut. Their survey or their long line survey is very efficient at catching big halibut, but is terrible at catching little halibut. Conversely, we're the complete opposite. So they collaborate with us a lot. They send people out on our boats. They use our data for small halibut, and then they use their long line data for the big halibut. And one of the reasons I point that out is this means that really what you're seeing here is a distribution of young halibut, more than the ones that you would probably seek out if you're commercial fishing or subsistence fishing. There are areas where they cross over. I've heard these rumors that people have done well for big halibut right up in here. But we also know that there's long line fishermen out of Savunga that are doing just fine on the north side of uh, St. Lawrence Island. It looks like on our map we caught nothing there. That's because the big halibut avoid are here. It's as simple as that. And you can see that here with the lake data. So we are here in the big halibut. We don't really get much. We get a lot more in the, the smaller size classes. Yellowfin sole. This is a species that's reacting even differently than everything else to the warming patterns. And it's kind of fascinating. One of our colleagues actually put out a paper on this this year. Yellowfin sole are very um, tolerant of the warmer uh, water conditions. They can also tolerate cold water conditions. But one of the things that's very unique with them in regards to our survey is um, <clears throat> early in the, or I guess like late in the winter to early spring, they go way inshore, way up into these areas that we're really not even getting into the sample, very shallow water, and that's where they spawn. Okay. After they spawn, they start to move offshore. So historically in our surveys, we would see patterns like what you see in 2010, where the areas with the highest densities of yellowfin sole were in very close. And in fact, you can kind of tell by the um, density plot that we're probably missing a lot that's in even shallower than what we're fishing, right? Because the water is so much warmer, they actually are going inshore sooner than they used to spawning and now moving offshore sooner than they used to. And that's moving the distribution to where it looks like on our map that the fish are actually now invading other habitats. When in reality, it's just that they're getting there sooner than they did before. And we see that so that like up here in 2010, they're all in this area, they start to move out into this area, and then down to here. So we actually start to see this kind of near shore to offshore movement, just based on the fact that the water is warmer sooner. And so their actual spawning migration is happening sooner than it did historically. No, actually yellowfin sole are, you know, a big one is like this. Um, although in terms of the commercial fishery, this might be kind of a new band, there's actually a large commercial fishery for them in the um, southeastern Bering Sea. The, my understanding of it is the largest flatfish fishery in the world is for yellowfin sole. And this is actually a problem for those guys 
because when they're in really in shore, when they go up to fish, they're kind of the only thing that's in there. So they use shallow draft boats, go into shallow water, fish get almost nothing but yellowfin salt. With the fish moving off sooner now, they're getting out, mixing with other fish, increasing their bycatch. And so they're trying to find ways to figure out how to either get inshore sooner with the fish or find ways to reduce the bycatch. This is becoming a problem. Because remember where the halibut were? So when the fish are yellowfin are way inshore, they can get them without getting the halibut. Now, you know, especially here, they're in the same areas. They don't want that. There's not much to be said about the, the distribution of um, differences, at least in the northern Bering Sea uh, for yellowfin salt, other than compared to the southeastern Bering Sea, which I don't show here, we see more small fish up here than we do down south, but not in a, in a grand way. And here's a case where you don't see really much of anything that we would consider to be very young fish. And that's again, because of that whole catchability issue. They're way further inshore than what we sample, and they're also very small. So they go through our meshes. The, the northern rocks will do as well. If you remember um, with the northern rocks, there was like this little bump, and then it was a little bit bigger with a slightly bigger fish. That isn't because there's necessarily more. It's because when they get slightly bigger, we're catching slightly more of them. Bearing flounder. So this is actually a species that's a bit of a, and also a cold water uh, flounder species, flatfish species. And so when we look at their distribution, they're very much limited typically to what we would consider to be those cold pool waters. So in the Northern Bering Sea, it was about 12,000 metric tons in uh, 2010, but they were able to spread out for a fairly large area. It increased to almost 20,000 metric tons in 2017. That's in part because they all got pushed up into this area, and there's more of them on the northern Bering Sea of the line, side of the line than there is to the south. And again, based on kind of the uncertainty on our survey, there's really kind of no difference this year. So a slight decrease, but not any really good, great consequence. But also still in Anson's country, right in that area that we still have at least some cold water. Now for the southeastern Bering Sea, because that cold water is moving more to the north, we see a big drop here, because there's almost no cold water, remember, on the southeastern side in the last two years. There was at least some in 2017, so we see this jump in numbers for right here. Last escape, this is another species we're starting to see a little bit more of in uh, the northern Bering Sea than we did historically, um, but not in great numbers. But they're still in that same area. They want to be where that Alaska current goes up, where the water's a little bit warmer. Warty sculpin. Um, this is a species that uh, uh, is kind of interesting in the sense that when we first started sampling and doing the survey in 2010, there's a possibility there was actually two species we were calling the same name. Uh, one extends all the way over into the Atlantic side, it's very small. Sculpin species, kind of drab brown, but it matures at a small size. And then there's this kind of larger one that's very colorful that extends all the way down in the southeastern Bering Sea, matures at a larger size, but based on some early genetics work and um, morphometric characteristics, they were thought to maybe be the same. But getting mature at a different size, looking slightly different, we wanted to confirm this. So we geared up before the 2017 survey to do genetics work on the species in hopes that we could tease this apart. But with the warm conditions, that small species that extends all the way to the Atlantic side disappeared from our survey. They, the, the lack of cold water, I think, probably pushed them out. So now, in reality, we're only seeing these larger ones in the last two years. <laughs> and um, we're seeing a, um, a decline, at least between 2017 and 2019. This jump is similar to the one that we saw for blue king crab for the same reason. He's like a little bit harder bottom. And when we were able to better fish the harder bottom areas in 2017, the biome mass estimate jumped up. So now it's coming down. The 
And so there's that small species talking about. <clears throat> and then there's a few of these guys. Here's what we got when we were able to fish the crater bottom. And then just we just didn't catch much at all this last year. Yeah, that's that's at least the theory. And then actually people who are doing beam flow work in the Chukchi and Beaufort are still seeing them. Plain sculpin, this is a similar species, it's actually in the same genus, but it likes a little bit softer habitat, really mucky bottom, also a little bit warmer water. So we're seeing their numbers very much on this near shore edge. Also, this is another one of these ones that may be getting a little bit pushed by the uh, warming. Not as much as others, but in 2017 and 2010, they were closer to shore, at least in terms of distribution than what we saw in 2019. Purple orange sea stars. Uh, we really like to try to keep a uh, good assessment of what's going on with the sea stars. This is in part because, um, in particular, this species. This, so this species um, is actually considered an invasive in the Southern Ocean. They got introduced through ballast water off of Australia and are a big deal, big problem for them. And part of the reason why is that they get um, labeled with terms like keystone species, which is just a really fancy way of saying they can have a large impact on the benthic community structure of an ecosystem. I like to think of it as almost like a pack of wolves effect. So when you have large numbers of purple orange sea stars, that are very efficient predators and we can move through an area and restructure the way the ecosystem functions because they'll essentially eat most of the clams and snails and whatnot in that area as they move through. So that's basically direct competition for walrus food and whatnot in this region, probably with other seals. Um, they probably know better than I, but certainly with walrus, they're going to be a big competition. And so we wanted to keep a good count on what was going on with them. There's been a steady increase in the biomass, um, went from 296,000 to 331,000 to 414,000. In the early goings of working up here, it looked like there were also some range extensions. They were starting to expand the area. But at least in this last year, if that's not been the case, it looks like we're kind of inhabiting the same areas, but the numbers are still going up. Okay, so sea peaches. So this is a tunicate species. And uh, oddly enough, th this one is something that we're interested in for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, is that these are a, a, a food item for some of the villages in the area, particularly the villages on uh, St. Lawrence Island and Gamble and Savunga seem to covet this. I've heard that they're actually quite good. Apparently you uh, boil it a little bit, peel it, and then freeze it. Just freeze it? Okay. And um, I've never actually tried them, but this is also one of those sessile um, animals that just lives on the bottom. So it does not have the ability to get up and move based on adverse conditions. So it's one of those things that can actually tell you a lot about changes in ecosystem function. So we're a little bit concerned about this in the terms of we went from 368,000 metric tons to only 102,000 metric tons to 27,000 metric tons. And oh, I need to note that um, we've never really done biomass estimates on tunicates before, before we started finding out that eight people were eating them and we started becoming more concerned about what's going on with the benthic communities up here. So these numbers are not just for that species, it's actually for all tunicates but the distribution map for just that one species. Okay, so this is a, these numbers are higher than it would be for just that one, but the trend is essentially the same. Jellyfish, this is another one that's got us a bit confused. For a long time, and there's been a number of papers published on this, um, it was thought that when water temperature is colder, so our colder years in the southeastern Bering Sea were the better years for jellyfish. So warmer years, years when there's less cold pool would be poor years for jellyfish. 2010, colder year, large numbers of jellyfish all throughout that area we would consider cold, particularly down here by the Alaska Peninsula. 2017, in the southeastern Bering Sea, warm year, jellyfish are certainly down compared to what you see here. 
except where? In the northern Bering Sea. This was confusing because this water is actually really warm. In fact, in a lot of cases, this water is as warm as not warmer than here. So why are they doing well in the north? We don't really know. Then things got really thrown on their head the last two years. We saw this last year in the rapid response survey, and then also this year in 2019, where now all of a sudden jellyfish are doing well everywhere in one year. Don't really know. One possible partial solution is that if you look at the pictures of the jellyfish, this one right here with all the radiating lines, that's uh, Chrysiora. That used to make up about 99% of what we would catch. In terms of jellyfish. What we're starting to see now is more and more of the other species added in. So this one over here is not actually that dark. It's taken a picture that's taken on a dark background. Um, that's actually a, a Aurelia, but there's a whole suite of species that kind of people throw in the same category. They'll call them moon jellies and things like that. These are smaller, kind of clear jellyfish. We're seeing a whole lot more of those in our survey. They tend to be something that we'd associate with being a warmer water jellyfish, something we would see in the Gulf, more than what we see in the Bering Sea. And we're starting to see more of the Cyanea and Basilophora species. Uh, and they have fun names for us, like the uh, bright egg jellyfish, things like that. So we're starting to see more instances of these other species. Now, it isn't enough to account for the, this entire trend, but it's at least part of the picture. We, want to try to track and find out what's going on with jellyfish populations because they are incredibly efficient predators in the midwater. So they are really good at capturing zooplankton, so copepods and krill, the same stuff that say whales and seabirds want to eat. They're also really good at catching little larval fish. So these are really efficient predators of stuff that's in the water column. Pacific herring. Herring has done well in the warmer conditions. Um, we went from, at least in the northern Bering Sea, from 23,000 metric tons to 34 to 80,000 metric tons. And the, they're actually pretty big. We got some of the biggest herring this year on the survey that I think I've ever seen. There was a few instances I had to go back and look twice to make sure they really were herring. And herring are pretty distinctive. You don't tend to mix them up with much, at least not around here, where there isn't shad or anything else up here to confuse them with. So we were a little bit surprised. Okay. And, but they're also more in the, that same kind of Alaska coastal current water, but also we didn't see so much, say, north of St. Lawrence Island, but down in the kind of the southern portion of what we call the Northern Bering Sea. And that area kind of south of Nunavak Island seemed to be where we got the most. But large increases in hearing. I was talking this morning with Charlie Eaton. He didn't seem terribly surprised by this. Or Charlie Lean, sorry. Charlie Eaton is a guy who owns a boat in uh, Seattle that may be selling it to a lab very quickly. <laughs> um, he was mentioning that even in the past, when they would get slightly warmer conditions, he would start seeing larger herring and more herring. So, you know, this is a much grander trend of that, but essentially, yeah, he, he wasn't surprised by the numbers. Capelin, on the other hand, this is a forage fish species that's very important to whales and birds and marine mammals and even to people uh, as a food resource, very nutrient rich fish, high lipid content, also a more Arctic species, tends to be very much tied to cold water. So 2010, our cold year, we got a biomass estimate around 14,000 metric tons, pretty much in the colder areas, except for there's also some down here in shallow water in the bay. Number drops precipitously in the Northern Bering Sea in uh, 2017 to 180 metric tons, dropped even lower in 2019 to only 50 metric tons. And again, this is one of these ones where you can kind of start to ID the blotches, but you can pretty much count the fish on your fingers. Yeah, okay. This is also um, something I should have mentioned with the Arctic cod, but I'll reiterate it here is, remember also that just because we see these large declines, it doesn't mean large mortality events. It can mean a couple of things. One is, is that we know these fish associate heavily with colder water. We're sampling in the summer, 
There's not cold water here. These fish are highly mobile. Most pelagic fishes are. So they're going to be where the cold water still is. So they're going to be up by the ice. You know, hopefully as the ice comes south, maybe they'll come down. Same with the Arctic cod. Okay, so this doesn't mean that there was a large one colony of them. The other thing is, is that these are very small fish. They tend to be in the water column. That's not where our deer fish as well. And with these changes, there can be that catchability factor we're talking about before, where they're just using the habitat differently than they did before. So there's a number of reasons why you could have this trend and have it not be that essentially all cape are gone. In fact, the most likely thing is, is that they're up where the water temperatures are what they prefer and in the trend. Rainbow smelt, on the other hand, um, are a species that um, is actually uh, likes that uh, sort of like saffron cod. They handle um, lower salinity water well. They also are well adapted to the warmer temperatures. And we see them uh, pretty heavily in those near shore waters above Nunavak and into uh, Norton Sound. With the warmer temperatures, they end up getting almost 5,000 metric tons in 2017. And basically, an inconsequential decrease in 2019. And they're pretty big smell, nice, big, healthy smell that we've seen well, for the last two years. And actually, they do truly like shallower water, so the population is probably even bigger if you can get into those areas that we're not surveying. So, all of this area here, I'll have quite a few smell from it. Neptune well. So this is one of the more abundant large sea snails that occurs in the northern Bering Sea region. So we wanted to start producing, looking at data for species like this for a couple of reasons. One is, is that communities, well heck even I eat this. These are very tasty. Um, they're in large numbers, they're quite big. They are also um, walrus food. And um, we want to get an idea of whether or not there's actual changes occurring to the walrus food base. Like I said before, things like bivalve clams are too far below the surface. Our net just doesn't catch them. That isn't something that we can use as an index. Um, in fact, what actually controls how many clams we catch in our net has nothing to do with what their availability is. It has to do with how many starfish are in the area because the starfish will grab them and haul them up and then we will get them and the, the starfish will drop them before we get them up on deck. So, we'll get clams based on how many starfish we catch, not based on how many clams there are. But these guys we actually catch reasonably well, as we think. And so we wanted to get an idea of what their populations are looking like. And we've been providing samples to Gay to use these for um, harmful algal bloom testing. Because these guys will actually start to bioaccumulate the same as other um, benthic invertebrates, some of the, the cysts and whatnot that can cause um, paralytic shellfish poisoning and so on and so forth. But in terms of biomass numbers, we're still trying to wrap our heads around exactly what's going on here. We went from 110,000 metric tons in 2010 to 178,000, which we went to increase in 2017, and then an 18% drop in 2019. I don't think we have a super good handle yet on what our catchability of this is. It may be very patchy. It may be that sometimes we hit more um, than other times. Um, or it may be that there actually is a lot of change in these populations. The other thing that we don't have a good handle on with the snails is actually what the lifespan or longevity is of the species. There is a little bit of a hint that they may be reasonably long-lived because um, these actually taste well enough, good enough, and um, are popular enough that there was actually an attempt to start up a commercial fishery out of the, the Pribilof Islands for um, the larger Neptune snails, which is a complex of species, not just this one. And um, they started having actually localized depletion issues near the Pribilof Islands pretty quickly. And so then they gave up on it. So basically they were going out dropping down all these little snail pots. And then they started realizing that they were having to go further and further to get them. And since they weren't getting a really great market value because people, you know, the US uh, market was not exactly used to this idea of eating snails. And so they were not getting a high market value, even though they're very tasty. So they gave up on it. But there's large numbers of these around, but we don't have a good feel for this. But part of it was to kind of figure out what's going on with the distribution of walrus food and to provide more data for tracking uh, harmful algal blooms in the area. 
special studies. So this is something we're doing really quickly, but the stuff I wanted to make aware people here. In addition to collecting all the data that you just saw, we do a number of what we call special studies, which is additional science that's beyond just this uh, ecosystem monitoring. It can be for a whole number of purposes to help out researchers across the country or even around the world. But a lot of these also have um, very tangible um, effects or information that could be valuable to people here. So we're going to go over three of them real quickly, but there's just a list so you know that um, kind of some of the stuff that we do. One of them is, is that we talked about this before, this idea of trying to figure out uh, how much movement there actually is with both the pollock and cod in the region. Are they staying year round? Where are they willing to um, uh, hang out under the ice when it actually finally does drop down? Are they going into Russian waters? There's kind of two ways we can get at this. One is, is through genetics. We've started doing that work too, where we essentially get tissue samples from cod and we look for markers that are similar to fish that are from other regions. But that takes generations to develop. It's hard to say. So if these fish came up here and are now staying here, we don't know. We can't always tell from genetics um, whether or not this is kind of a new population that's developing here or whether or not it's still connected to stuff in, say, in Russia or even the southeastern Bering Sea. But we can use telemetry tags. So these are actually very expensive tags that we put on the fish. They go out, swim around, and it's collecting data all the time on the position where these fish go. Then up to a year later, the tag actually releases from the fish, floats to the surface, and transmits all of its data of the movement patterns and environmental conditions, temperature, depth, light that that fish experience to a satellite and we're able to download it. And from that, not only can we figure out where they went, but sometimes you can even figure out what they did. You can figure out what are foraging trips and what may have been um, spawning aggregations. All of this kind of stuff can actually be proved out based on that data. And the tags look like this. It sort of looks like a um, half inflated black balloon. And there's a little saddle that actually goes from the fish's body right here above the fin. I'm pointing this out for one big reason, and that is, is that if someone here goes uh, subsistence fishing or sees one on the beach and you see it with this tag, we would love to have this back. That data is invaluable to us, and the tags are actually very expensive too. So um, we would greatly appreciate it if you see that. Also, you know, kind of like tongue in cheek with someone bringing this up earlier today, it's not a Russian spy fish. This is actually our tags that we're trying to collect data with. Um, this is uh, one of our scientists also holding one here. Um, one of the great things with these tags as well is that we were able to uh, put tags out from our research vessels. So that's what these are here and here and here. But we've also been able to work with the long line fishermen out of Sabunga to put tags out nearer shore than what we can get with their vessels. And that was highly successful. And we're hoping to do more of that kind of work. It would be invaluable to get more data from more species, including pollock in the future, and also cod in other locations. Maybe some up here closer to the Bering Strait, maybe closer to Nome. And so we're hoping that we can do more collaborations like what we've been able to do with the Savunga fishermen to get more tags out of this type so we can get a better idea of fishermen to treat the area. We've also put out um, acoustic moorings. So this is what we were talking about before. So these are these kind of like little domes, little turtles that we drop on the seafloor. They turn on every once in a while and they've got an echo sounder in them. Sends a signal up towards the surface, bounces back down. And not only does it essentially count the fish that are above it, but it can tell what direction they're moving. Okay? And so what we've done is we put those right along here, four units on our side of the Russian boundary to get an idea of how much east-west movement we're actually getting in Pacific, uh, of, of walleye pollock. And the reason why they're put here, opposed to say up here in the northern Bering Sea area, is pollock tend to want to be in deeper water. And so this is kind of more in their normal depth. Range. So we think we're more likely to get a good number of pollock to tell us how much movement there is in that location opposed to the north. So these things will stay out for an entire year. Next year, one of our research boats, the Astrid Bison, will go into this area. They send down an acoustic signal, kind of like a little uh, uh, signature. 
that tells this thing to release and it'll float to the surface and they'll recover the, the moorings and then download all the data. So we won't know anything from this study for a year. Same as with the tagging. It's gonna take basically a year until the tags pop up and we get data back. So this will be very exciting. We don't really have a good idea yet of how much movement we have across the line. Third one is this whole idea of fish condition. <clears throat> Trying to get an idea of more, like I said, historically, we had the idea that uh, fish in the Bering Sea were all really healthy. It was really something to think about. But one of the things that we started to see in recent years, particularly in the southeastern Bering Sea, and also partly in the north, is skinny fish, fish that don't necessarily look like they're at their prime condition. Conversely, we can get into other areas, like in the case of Pollock, north of St. Lawrence Island, up towards the Bering Strait, they're very fat and sassy. They look like they're doing just fine. So we're trying to get a better idea of the actual condition or overall health of the fish in the region. But this takes a lot of work. The ideal way to do this is very labor intensive and very ex expensive. You do something called proximate composition analysis, which this will sound gross, but essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a big fish and you're gonna basically grind the thing up like in a great big blender and you break it down into its constituent composition. You figure out exactly how much lipid there is in it, how much carbohydrate, how much uh, ash makes up that fish. And for relative to its size, you then know exactly what its health was, how much energy is stored in that fish. But we don't want to do that. It's very expensive. So we're looking at different metrics that we can use. One is um, what they call a residual, a length weight residual. Residual is a big fancy word for essentially a, a difference. And so what we do here is we take fish that we get a length on and its weight. And we compare that weight to what the mean weight is from all of our data for a fish of that size. If that difference is positive, so essentially that fish is heavier for its length, that would be a positive residual, the idea being that that's a healthier fish. If it's lighter, it's a negative residual, that fish is not as healthy for its size. There's things that affect this though. One is, is that it depends on what you have for data for the um, means, like where are you gonna pool and pull your data for the mean weight from. We have very limited, this is all from the Northern Bering Sea, we have very limited data from up here because we've only been up here for three years where we were able to collect this kind of information. So that limits our ability to use this method. The other thing would be what? What might actually really impact this number? Essentially what's in their gut. A full or empty stomach all of a sudden has a huge impact on whether or not you're gonna have a positive or negative residual. And do you think that like the overall health of a species is really garnered by what its last meal was? It's kind of not. So that's not great, but we're trying to work on it. One of the things too is there's a highly regionalized um, effect. So this is all data from the Northern Bering Sea. We've been doing this in cooperation with NOM ADFMD and NACDC and folks from the Northwest Fishery Science Network. So when we look at walleye pollock, one of the things we see is this is all negative residuals, saying that the fish are not healthy that are in this area. But I just told you they look really great north of St. Lawrence Island, right? So why is that? Well, this is because the fish that are south of St. Lawrence Island are really not. Okay, so that's enough to where we start getting actually a fairly low but significant negative condition factor when we look at the entire moment very soon. So we need to break this out smaller or use a different method. When we look at age one pollock, so those young fish, uh, they're going to look fine. They're nice, fat, and sassy, even with little fish. They're eating well in the water column. In Pacific Cod, it's a little bit more mixed. In 2017, it was uh, negative, but the last couple of years it's actually been positive. And cod are one of the ones that can have the biggest impact on whether or not they have a very good stomach or not. One of the technologies we're trying to, to uh, test is something called a fat meter. And that's what you see being used here. So this is essentially this device that looks at the proportion of water that's in the tissue. Okay, so essentially if the animal is integrating a lot of water, essentially blowing itself up, it tends to be a healthier fish relative to ones that are skinnier and are not, there's less water. So this thing actually runs a current across a plate here and you get a resistance number back. 
and that should be relative to the overall condition or health of the fish. But it's never been used on northern stocks before, fish that have lower lipid contents. So it's mainly designed for using on albacore tuna or even salmon or things of that nature. So we're trying to see if we can actually use it using new um, um, calibration factors for fish up here. This is very new, it hasn't been used in this area before. Yeah, Jake, thank okay. <laughs> so it's a little bit mixed here. But basically, these are positive residuals. So that means, on average, the fish up here were heavier than you would expect them to be in three out of the four years. Okay. Um, why they weren't in 2017, I don't think we really know yet. And I'm not, I'm not putting a lot of stock into this yet. We're still kind of trying to develop this and work out how it works. The other thing that's a bit of a problem for us is we have to remember a little bit of the history of our survey up here, right? We came up in 2010 and we didn't really catch big pollock, right? So. There's really no data here to even compare. But we did catch juvenile pollock at age one, so we have some good data here for this. And remember, this data was not collected with the severed being result. We also got some specific cause, but this is actually based off of very few fish. So when you have a low N, it doesn't take much variation to have a large impact on your data. Now you come to 2017. When we came up here in 2017, we still thought we were studying a bottom-up ecosystem and we're trying to see potential incremental long-term changes to the environment. We didn't come up here in 2017 going, like, oh, before we even got here, there's going to be a whole bunch of pollock and cod up there. That was a complete and utter surprise. So we weren't geared up to even collect. The way we get the length weight data, historically in our data, is that that's from fish that we collect aging structures. From. We actually collected odorless. Do you think we bring supplies to do all that, especially when it uses chemicals for fish we don't think are going to be there? No. That's a lot of work. So we showed up in 2017 having to scramble to come up with stuff to even collect the data that this is based on from that year. So in 2017, these are also based off of really small data sets. Okay. 2018. We didn't plan to be here at all. So do you think we were geared up that year to collect that kind of data? In fact, we ran out of supplies on the boat, trying to move things around to do the best we could with what we had, because we didn't even go back to the port. We found out and basically made the decision we were coming north before we could actually reprovision the vessel. So this data is really limited. So 2019, this year, was our first chance where we were geared up knowing that we needed to collect data on condition and started trying to do it. So really, we've got this as our most common data set at this point. So just a quick general summary. So 2010 is our one cold year. But it's offering us a really good snapshot for comparison between the 2017 and 19 data set. Well, we're now starting to see what essentially a warm stanza looks like for the Northern Bering Sea um, and what kinds of distributions we're likely to see. We're starting to see similar patterns in subsequent years. Subarctic species are expanding, dispersing, and now we can tell from work from colleagues, likely recruiting in the region. They are here trying to stay. Arctic species are retracting. So Arctic cod, Cape Cod, Bering flounder, et cetera, we're seeing much fewer of these species. But again, this isn't necessarily mortalities. There were the habitats optimal for them. It's just in the summer, it's not here when we're sampling. Or in some cases, it may be the catchability is slightly different. And they're doing something different to where we don't get them. 
we've already got this area, this has become enough of an issue to where um, our funding for surveys has been very uncertain in recent years, but we've already got partial funding to come back in 2020. But long-term monitoring is obviously necessary to get a better understanding of what's going on throughout this ecosystem. We don't know even what our full funding is for next year, let alone beyond that. A lot of unknowns. How long will the current warm stands have persist? Um, this could be a cold year. It's not looking like it. It sounds like um, Rick gave you guys kind of uh, our news on that front last week. Um, but essentially the extent of winter sea ice will have an impact on the migration, mortality, and survival of northern bird sea fish under the ice. We just don't know the answer to these questions yet. Also, what is the stock structure of health? movement pattern in the subarctic and arctic ocean region. We're starting to try to get a better handle on that with doing the fish condition work, some of the other things, but we're just getting started. This is areas of research that are novel to us. It wasn't things that we thought we were going to have to do or this quickly. So again, that kind of comes into this kind of tagging and genetics work, fish condition work. And some of that work is very long term, it takes a while to build up enough data to, to know what this is. Hard to do that when we don't know, you know, like one of the things that's kind of tricky is the funding cycles. Say if we have to go for outside funds, would be like NPRB. That's one of the ways we can get money to try to do things like the fish condition work or genetics or tagging. If we apply now, it would mean that we would have the money from them in 2021. But we don't know if we'll have a survey up here in 2021. Any questions? Here's people that are uh, actually doing various projects we actually had pots in the stomachs for figuring out the trophic work, taking measurements on the crab to figure out maturity and development. Um, that's the vessel crew and our scientists um, with uh, Myra from NSCDC who participated on a survey and uh, some of the cloud tagging work being done by um, uh, Liz Dawson there in the upper right hand corner. Yeah. Again, I, I cherry picked just some stuff. There, oh, yeah. Oh, not, not in this talk, that's in the wall. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Actually, if you look in uh, that summary document that's in the back, early on in there, there's a big table. And even that is a bunch of stuff that's kind of combined, but there's a lot of species that we collected on it. I mean, we could talk not just for hours, but for days if we went through them all. Again, everything from an amphipod on up, we're pretty much identifying the best we can to species and collecting uh, information on it. Any questions for Lyle? I know we've done a lot of research, like with the ice pack and stuff like that. Do you personally feel that like many of these things we're seeing are cyclical or are we following a trend? So, Okay, so I'm not a climatologist. That's not my area of expertise. But the way I would address that question is to say that um, when you look at the models that have been developed for, like, say, climate change for this region, essentially what they've all said, and they continue to say, is that you're going to have periods where it's getting warmer, then you could have some cold years, you could have some warm years, but the net change is going to be that you're going to steadily get warmer, but at an incremental rate. Right. One of the things that we're seeing happen with um, the fishery data throughout the region is that um, in the early days, let's see here if I can actually get back to that screen. We explained it really well. This is a good question. Yeah. When you look at the bottom temperature here in the early days of our survey, essentially, here's the mean. So we have a year that's almost on the mean, a little higher, a little lower. We essentially would just kind of bump back and forth around the mean, right? More breath. Right. And so what you start to see is this kind of pattern where you start kind of, oh, there's three years in a row, or two years in a row, four years in a row, eight years in a row. We started referring to this as the stand effect. So we're trying to have this kind of periodicity where we stay warm for a while, then we go cold for a while, then we go warm for an even longer while. This is raising a lot of questions for 
climatologists and for oceanographers, they focus on this more than we do. We tend to be more nuts and bolts, you know, rubber meets the road kind of scientists in the way we do this. But we're in a warm stand for now. Now, will this drop back down? We're going to go into a cold stand for the next few years? It's possible. I don't really know the answer to that. But you can see the pattern developing, right? Um, the other thing is, is that, and this is partly what surprised us, is there's kind of a, a, a meshing of effects here. And um, one is, is this whole idea of climate change, right? So this kind of steady incremental warming. The other is, is where it intersects with weather. Weather is the cold pool, okay? How your winter was in terms of ice last year will determine the following summer's cold pool extent. So your weather one year, not climate change, not this long-term process. But just one winter, we had not really considered in our shop the idea that we could have one warm winter and have the whole cold pool break down into this level of movement that fast. We thought this was something that was going to happen on a generational level, not a season or two seasons. So that's been something we've had to really ramp up and kind of wrap our heads around in our line of work. But again, that has more to do with weather interacting with climate change than it being a specific change. And it raises a lot of questions for us that we don't really know the answer to right now. Let's say things just start getting really cold up here. I mean, I know Gay will be extremely happy. Lots of people will be extremely happy. You have a bunch of ice come back, the cold pool comes back. What do these fish do then that are up here? We don't know the answer to that. Ah, good question. So the tricky thing there is, is that um, between our data set between 1982 and now, we track bottom temperatures. And here's literally how much cold there was. There have been years when it's been smaller, right? And they tended to be short term periods. So here in like 2003, it was pretty low. And this is another one of these things that's been amazing with working with some of the communities around here. Because we started to wonder, when we have this smaller, truncated cold pool, so it's more to the northwest, did fish move then? Well, we've been able to actually vet this, talk to some of the communities. We found out, well, yeah, around this time, they saw more cod. They did okay. I mean, they weren't targeting them, but to have some of them wash up on their beach, again, it's not like these fish are just totally new to the area. There's been pollock and cod up here, but just not in the numbers we're seeing now. And it looks like there has been forays that have happened in the past, just not on the scale we're seeing right now. But we've been able to only figure that out because we didn't have data through conversations with people up here. And that's been incredibly powerful for us. Any other questions? Really thankful, Rob, that you and your colleagues come up here and provide us this level of information about the whole ecology of our world is Uh, we're happy to do it. And um, I know that this is kind of a lot and it's a big shotgun blast to kind of just give you a look at lots of different things. But if you have questions about stuff that still isn't making sense or things that you find in the summary document, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to try to um, have more conversations. Like I said, one of the things that we're learning over time is that the people up here are the sentinels of the region. Every time we have these conversations, I think I come away with more knowledge than I, than I came in with. And it's helping us have a better understanding of what's going on here. So it's a two-way street and it's incredibly valuable to us too. So we'll try to do our best to keep that door open as long as we can. Another question. So one bit of news I've learned recently, because of this, this specific cod, you know, I thought it would take industry a while to get here. But in talking with the Coast Guard earlier today, it seems we have Long line across the surge, more than one, multiple, um, north of or have been working this summer and, and even somewhat recently, um, north of St. John's Island. So I don't know if anyone's been seeing that if you're traveling in the bay like here, but they've been working on the similar scenario. So the industry is responding to this. Um, we have a lot of them, over 17 more, these are. 